What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Brown Girl Green, where I interview environmental leaders and advocates about the importance of diversity and inclusion, as well as creative solutions to the climate crisis. And I am really excited to continue my conversation that I had a couple months ago on the show about deep seabed mining. This is a topic that I think a lot of people still don't know as much about, but I wanted to take the time for this episode to talk about deep seabed mining. And this time, you know, last time we had this amazing guest, um, incredible scientist, Diva Amen. I highly recommend you checking out that previous episode. Uh, we really dive into the science behind deep se- seabed mining. So if you have never heard of that term or know what it is or want to know the science behind it, definitely check out that previous episode. Uh, and for people who are just now hearing about this, deep seabed mining is basically this perspective commercial industry that is being proposed as a way to mine for future future minerals and metals in the deep deep seafloor and the idea is to get things like manganese copper cobalt zinc and rare earth minerals and metals and basically why are people doing this we are running a, we are literally running out of land and a lot of these metals and so a lot of companies now are trying to figure out okay, like we're actually running out of the metals and minerals that we over extracted. Let's over extract another place, aka the deep sea. And the thing about the deep sea is that there, a lot of scientists have yet to barely even scratch the surface of the deep sea. And you know, there is a potential of finding things like medicines and other habitats and new species that could be critical for future human survival, resilience to the climate crisis, things of that nature. And yet these companies are like, yeah, 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 the great unknown, explored wonder of the world that is the deep sea. But ultimately it's like, we want to, ultimately we want to extract the profit from that industry and we're going to take advantage of these resources. So that's the mindset, which is not great when it comes to thinking about the environment and thinking about the planet. And so I really wanted to to do a follow-up episode to get two perspectives. One is about the indigenous perspective, so communities that actually live um, in coastal communities that are going to be threatened by future deep seabed mining operations. And I also wanted to talk to businesses that are actually now thinking, hey, we're going to opt out of deep seabed mining. We don't necessarily need that. to rely on that practice we're going to be thinking about other ways that we can source these minerals or if we are going to source these metals for our projects or our products um, we're going to figure out a way to recycle it figure out ways to be more efficient and effective to address that so overall i really wanted this episode to bring in new angles because the previous episode talks a lot about the science and Again, listen to that episode, we really dive deep into that, but I really wanted this episode to kind of cover new angles and new territory, and so yeah, I think you'll find it to be quite interesting, the the angles we dive into in today's episode, and I hope that you gain as much wisdom out of it as I did. So, hope you take a seat, dive deep into the sea with me, and take a listen. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another exciting episode of Brown Girl Green, and today we are diving back into the topic of deep seabed mining. I released an episode on this late last year talking about this practice, which we're going to dive deeper into in today's episode. If you don't know what deep seabed mining is and you've never heard of it before, we are going to talk with an expert who lives in the Global South in Tonga, who is on the front lines fighting against deep seabed mining. And for people who don't know, I am not a huge fan of deep seabed mining. In fact, I think it needs to be banned ASAP. And there's lots of people around the world that are pushing for this practice to be banned. In this episode, we're going to talk about why it needs to be banned, why communities in the Global South who live on the front lines of dealing with this industry are fighting back against it as well and we are going to get perspectives on why people are realizing 
from the civil society to industries that this is a practice that cannot exist on planet Earth. So I'm really excited to have our guest today who is going to speak directly from the perspective of civil society fighting back against deep seabed mining to understand her viewpoint on it. And I hope that you all gain a lot of educational insights and find out more information on how you can take action and get involved. So I will now have our guest introduce herself. Thank you very much, Christy. My name is Billy Natita Kara. I work for the Civil Society Forum of Tonga. It's the national deep sea mining campaign. My key role is to ensure that deep sea mining is banned totally from our EEZ as well as our sponsored spot in the area. The area is designated as an international piece of ocean that doesn't belong to any country. So the thinking around this is that belongs to all humankind, both coastal communities and landlocked communities. In Tonga, we have over just about 100,000 people. We have just a little bit over 75,000 square kilometers in land size, plus the ocean size. So put together, total 75,000 over square kilometers. 99% of that is ocean. So the land just make up the 1%. Over 89% are coastal communities. So we're group of islands, you know, the highest point in my island is actually 60 foot above sea level. And basically the ocean just roll right on where the coastal communities are. So our affinity to the ocean is very close. We literally grew up, you know, watching the ocean and the ocean watching us our whole lifetime. Mm -hmm. The idea of deep sea mining, an industry, an extractive industry that is going to go deep into the ocean, digging up minerals that they greenwash the whole advocacy about that is going to replace, you know, the fuel, you know, and is going to be the answer to the climate change crisis. I will say pull crap. Because what they are saying to the world and selling the idea that these minerals in the deep is going to save the world from the climate crisis, that is so wrong. Mm -hmm. Because they are looking at the Pacific. It's really our backyard that this whole testing, this whole, you know, push for the mm -hmm. exploitation is going to happen. It's not going to happen in the global north. It's going to happen mm -hmm. in the south. Tonga, Nauru, and Kiribati, all known to be poor, all known to be like basically oceanic people who are basically live depending on the ocean. Right? So the thinking that they are going to mine in the Pacific is a threat to my livelihood. You know, 99% of my people depend on the ocean. Like I said, it's literally there. That's where, you know, we, our grandparents used to stroll over to the reef get things to eat. These are the threats that we see deep sea mining as. So people ask, what is deep sea mining? You know, technically it's going to be, you know, a couple of huge gigantic ships. They're going to be floating on top of the ocean, operating remote control vehicles that will be let down into the deep ocean. And not known to many people, there are four layers of the ocean. And like every 200 kilometers down is one layer, one length. So deep sea mining is designated to any activity that will be undertaken beyond the two, two kilometers, right? Mm -hmm. And these are where the minerals rest. So the two kilometers, four kilometers, six kilometers, eight kilometers, because the deepest is down to 11. So these minerals, because they have been there for millions of years, they have actually diagnosis that the size indicated how many years it has been sitting there. So any recovery of these minerals will not be in our lifetime. 
maybe not in my children's lifetime mm -hmm. because you know it takes so long and imagine a place where these deposits have been sitting for so long every dust every dead things that had floated and sink every dead animals every rotten ships that have sunk and mm -hmm. goes all the way down have accumulated and every life form that dies Kirsty, you know have carbon in their body as a composition it's natural you know 70 percent of our body are made of you know a liquid and the others of natural masses and they have carbon so concentrated packing over millions of years so there are carbon stored there in the deep where some of these minerals are actually resting or being compiling over the years. So the fact that we're going to dig these out by using remote vehicles to go and to what some deem as picking, you know, <laughs> you fruit pick mm -hmm. because they fall off the tree onto a hard surface of ground, like let's say the soil or grass, and you pick it. Yeah. You're talking about picking manganese nodules from the ocean where accumulated sedimentations over a million of years that's not digging that is digging that's a vacuum i mean that means an activity is going to happen it's going to generate a lot mm -hmm. of bloom from the dust that have collected over billions and millions of years yeah. so that's the concern. That is basically what deep sea mining is all about. And when they are going to take the minerals up, there are pipes from this, you know, mega ship sail going to sit on top of the sea level. So these minerals are going to transport it up to the ship on top, deposit the solid ore there, and then the minerals there. And then the excess water that has accompanied all those minerals up need to be let down when we started the conversation in 2012 the thinking around and when all 2012 the, you know, shipbuilders and such well. geez i've started this around 2012 this is when i start the fight they say that they are going to take these minerals from whatever water column level be all the way up and they are going to return it all the way down to where it was taken from because within every elements of the water column you know the density is different the flow is different the temperature is different so there are different life forms to all the water columns so when you take this and return it back you know there was the thinking around it, but we don't know. But 2012, we we're screaming already. We don't know the science. We don't know enough. And they were selling mm -hmm. the idea that it was a tercet. No life form. It's basically a dead zone. So wow. why can't we just go in and pick the minerals? Mm -hmm. You know, 10 years, now, a decade later, we now have more scientific proof, more biological proof, more marine-based evidence that there are blooms of life in there millions of living species habitats that are actually thriving in this so-called dead zone so the idea that you know the water will be taken up and be brought down was something that was being said 12 years ago now everybody is all about the profit you know the more clearer the information the more solid the evidence, the cost is climbing because everybody thought it was a prospective business, the cold rush, then that's the latest goal at the time. Uh, right. Technology gone up. So the cost to actually transport all this wastewater all the way down become more costly and costly and costly. So the talking about now is it's not going to go all the way to its original place. It's going to be released somewhere in the water column. The fear is the first 200K distant from the top level, that's where a majority of the life forms are. And the threat to it is magnified so many other times.
times because you're looking at every life form, every conservation industry out there are screaming because we have been trying to conserve, you know, life form out there because we depend on it. And they help this whole, you know, what food, you know, that built this. We depend, the interdependency between us and them has already been confirmed. So these are the threats yeah. and the concern that we have. Thank you so much for that rundown on breaking down why deep sea bed mining is such an extractive and awful process. Can we back up a little bit? You said that in 2012, which is wild because I, I didn't know about DC bed mining until probably like 2021. So I guess like about two years ago, it was introduced to me as a concept, but you've been knowing about this for almost 10 years at this point or over 10 years. So over could you back up? Now. Yeah, that's amazing and crazy. And so I just want to know if we can back it up, like why was deep sea bed mining even introduced as a practice like why are people considering this industry and you're talking about it being this gold rush and also this very greenwashed practice that is very destructive could you walk us through a timeline of what you saw on how this got introduced and how you seeing how you're seeing it currently being like marketed now as this like mm. environmentally friendly practice which we know is a bunch of bs <laughs> my understanding that the whole deep sea minerals was something that was picked up in the 70s. At the time, it has a military background to why it was first cited. So I'm not gonna go really deep into that, but the Pacific has its, you know, history has started or long before the whole colonization process. You know, there's always prospectors from global north, you know, seeking, mm spices, seeking minerals, seeking metals, seeking things that were easily picked up. And the whole economic, the whole global economy is based on that, where you get the best resources for the cheapest and sell it for the highest, you know, as the cheapest in and maximize profit back. Eh? So it's all the whole global economy is a kind of philosophy. Mm. But so, so the scouting has always been there. So the sighting of the minerals and the prospect of it had, you know, been a research institution as well, as far as technology is concerned. In Tonga, we have the first company to show interest was the Nautilus company way back in 2008. So when we start discussing deep sea mining in 2012, we were shocked to found that we already have people who actually sign up, even establish a office in Tonga. And that was Nautilus. We had wow. at the time four prospectors who were doing exploration. So kids, science and technology from Korea. We have a company from the United States. We have the Nautilus Canadian, and they were actually basically buying up the whole ocean space for Tonga because we were actually charging the cheapest. So that's something that actually a company being poor, people don't really know, you know, what's the value that's out there and see people actually find these things. So when you start talking about it and, you know, at the time, as more research has been going on since 2008, the prospect of minerals in the deep you know, literally lying there. And that's the whole marketing strategy, literally lying there. So when I was talking to these people back in 2012, they were saying to me, Tita, it's out there. If you're not going to take it, somebody else is. So it's wow. a matter of who is going to get there first. Wow. And I said, what about the third option? What about just leaving it there? Because <laughs> I am sure, you know, the Pacific, a very Christian grounded, right? Mm. And I said, you know, I'm sure that God put it at that depth because it meant to be get there. I'm sure the one that we can access to as easily was meant to be there. Mm. You know, 
the fruit tree can just literally grow and bear fruit and, you know, you can pick it from there. I'm sure that the minerals were meant to be a dead depth for a very reason. And why human cannot access it. Now, humans and technology have created a means of getting in there without the, the person actually being in the ship, right? Having this remote control. But so the prospect and the marketing and... I plan this a lot in the whole marketing because the selling of what these minerals, you know, the, the metal company is actually selling this, you know, it's like a collective in one. It's a battery in a rock. Because mm -hmm. all the component to the so-called, you know, electric batteries where you have your electric right. cars that run, they feel that all the components that are currently being mined on land, you know, are all in one rock. So yeah. currently they have to mine different sites to actually get the battery. Now they're saying you can have one rock and it'll give you a battery and oh it will replace gosh. all the digging. So that's the marketing. And, you know, like any marketing, they say you get this with all the glitters and of course, we all know that 80% of the time are lies. We'll yeah. probably get a little two out of the seven features they say. We'll probably be lucky to have at least two of them. Right? Yeah. And they have the, if you are not satisfied, return it back. Right? So that's the kind of thinking they're having now. In my country, in Tonga, this battle with the government officials, the statement given to us is, why not run it? If it doesn't work, we can always resent it. There is no return back policy on this one. Because once you take it, like I said, it will take a whole generation of lifetime before you even see a small speck of it starting all over again. These minerals, I'm talking about these minerals. Right? So it's not something where you can like a pair of shoes if you wear it and it doesn't work, you can always return it back to the shop. It's not going to be like that. Yeah. And the whole process of going down there and the consequences of, you know, the bloom, the light, the noise, the vibration, and the impact on the life form that's out there, I just don't want to think about it. Yeah. But yes. The marketing have sell the minerals to the extent that people who are so greedy are just looking at mineral and thinking about it and go blink, blink, blink. They can see the profit numbers going up all the time. That's all it yeah. meant to them. But it's not to us. It spelled yes. doom. It spelled death. It spelled, you know, being deserted again. Yeah, I think the way that deep seabed mining has been marketed for the most part has been this, this practice that's going to be just more precise and that like the deep sea is this place that like has been untapped. And so unlike land, it can be more ecologically friendly because it's not going to rely on, you know, the on the ground labor of workers but we all know that like this we operate in a capitalist system that exploits labor and workers in order to mine and extract for these minerals and so for them to say that this is all of a sudden going to be this like super ethical practice i mean it's already hypocritical right because they're going in to these lands and these waters and saying like you were saying like if you don't get it well we want to get it, you know? And so already their ethics is questionable by even just that statement and just that mindset. And so I think what you're saying is that there is this new proposal for deep sea bed mining as this amazing solution to make the development of things like electric batteries and maybe even the things to construct things like solar panels in the future and other quote unquote clean energy technologies, we could basically mine for all of that in the deep sea. And they're saying that it's going to be found in one rock, which I think is insane, but you know, it makes a lot of sense that that's the way they're marketing it, right? It's like deep sea mining. It's like, okay, untapped land, 
super efficient process. You're going to extract the most wealth and profit for your investment of this mining operation for something they haven't even done research on. They're, they're kind of, they're talking about this huge, beautiful thing that they haven't even done before. So who's to say that it's not going to just be a huge bomb for the ocean? And that's what a lot of those of us who are fighting against it are saying, right? We're saying that, you know, we've seen this pan out in history before. History is literally repeating itself. But this time, who knows if we're going to really be able to go back. Because once you destroy the deep sea and the ocean and all of that beautiful life down there, it's the biggest carbon sink in on the planet. And once, who knows what they're going to drill and what's going to come up, once that's there and once that gets lost, we can never recover that. And so I think the fact that people want to experiment, explore is the huge hubris of humanity, as we've seen time and time again. And yet they're saying that this will be better this time. But it seems, again, like if it was really that better, then all of these other previous practices would have been more in line with thinking about ec ecological and social human impacts. So it's like, what it, you all are just greedy. Like, this is not going to change anything. Pussy. I, it's so sad as well. And I think that's the saddest thing about this, is that we have allowed a few greedy persons to dictate the fate of our universe. As you said, you know, if we go back and start it at the beginning of history of human era, you know, and pick up how many times some of our leaders have said, this is going to be better. Of yeah. all the marketing stunt that have sell, I am sure they did the same when they found fossil fuel. This mm -hmm. is the answer to yeah. our crisis. This is the answer to our... And that is the thing that it's, they are speeding the same one, you know? Yeah. Repackaging. Maybe then it was a warm piece of, you know, tree park that wrap around this whole, it's mm. going to happen at the time itself. Now it's, you know, golden wrappers wrap around with the same thing inside. It is for the greed. And the saddest is that they greenwash it and making us in a, you know, self feel that we're obligated to save humanity one more time. Save humanity <laughs> one more time. Yeah. Supply this because it's going to be the answer to the climate crisis. And, you know, I'm so fed up of people using our backyard to be their, you know, and East in the Pacific to be the rat, you know, um, yeah. lab rats to all the yeah. testing of this so-called, you know, human development. Um, we have some of the Pacific Islands that were used, Christmas Island is one of the island where America tests the nuclear waste, you know, the nuclear bombing, and people are still born deformed. And, you know, coconuts still have that, the residue of, you know, the nuclear chemicals. We're looking at, we are going to be the same here in the Pacific, you know. A company from Australia actually mined Nauru, and if you probably recall, Nauru is important in the whole deep sea mining campaign is because they trigger a clause in the ISA UNCLOS or the United Nations Convention for Law of the Sea that kind of push ISA to pass all regulation within two years. And because they triggered... And, like, and can you tell people years. what ISA is? ISA is the International Seabed Authority. This authority is in Jamaica, in Kinson, Jamaica. And that was established in, back, I think it was 82. And currently they have 136 members. Tonga is one of those members. So they kind of mandated to manage the ocean that is beyond any national jurisdiction. So backtracking that, every island state, like my island, Tonga, from the low tide to 200 kilometers into the sea, 
those areas of the ocean belongs to that island. So we can make laws and policy to cover in that area. Beyond that 200 meters nautical miles is the international waters. That's where international seabed authority have the authority to manage. So any minerals found around these areas belongs or is managed by the ISA. So since Nauru as part of the member of the 136 trigger that two year rule, ISA is under obligation to complete all regulation and policy within two years. And that will be the June 29 of this year. Wow. So a lot of people are very, very worried because they know ISA is not capable. Maybe I'll re backtrack that word. ISA would not be able to meet that deadline. Another part of that clause also means that if by the end of the two years, ISA is not ready with all the regulation and policy, whatever existing policy at the time should be enforced. Mm. So we are not ready in the region. As a matter of fact, on Friday last week, we launched for the first time a review of all legislation that we have in Tonga that is interconnected to protecting the ocean. So 20 pieces of our legislation is interconnected because whenever I talk about deep sea mining, everybody thinks that there are only two government institutes that should be worried about this. That's Ministry of Environment and the Fisheries. This review confirmed the interconnectivity of a whole lot of legislation, which also means a whole lot of government agencies that should be looking after this one. So I'm thinking, if Tonga is not ready, when it's only so small, imagine the ISA having to mandate it a whole bigger area. Right? Mm. So I think that's the worry we have now, that yeah. by June, what is going to happen? Would they go ahead yeah. and say, Granted exploitation, but the issue about us, Kirsty, is not just that, eh? The fact that they might proceed and granted exploitation license to some of these companies. I'm bold minded about the review we just had. It's meant that Tonga has already confirmed automatically a 40 year rules. If ISA say yes, to exploitation. Tonga will oh. gr automatically grant it 25 years of exploitation to the mining company. So from my life down to the next 40 years, they will mine nonstop in Tonga. Yeah, what is your biggest fear about, about them mining in Tonga? First, the government is not ready to actually assess the impact assessment. So, you know, they won't be liable if we don't know what to look for and what to make them, you know, mandated them to actually do to repair because part of the, the whole mining relationship and the so-called contractual obligation between parties and the sponsoring state is the fact that the state is obligated to monitor the company. But if the state has no idea, nor the expertise, nor the resources, nor the experience to monitor the company who has all the money in the law in the world and all the lawyers that could pay, the money could buy for, you know, how is that relationship compatible? Mm -hmm. And that's one of my be. Second is whatever happened down there, we have no idea. They are obligated to rehabilitate you know, or that mining area. We have now confirmed 
that there is no recovery within your lifetime. And how would we able to monitor when we'll be dead and gone <laughs> and the company taking the money and, you know. So that is the biggest in our governance structure and, you know, our management responsibility. The biggest and this top everything else is the fact that they will destroy the very livelihood that my people depends on. We have seen country who are uh, basically poor, but rich in abundance in their resources. Mm -hmm. That's defined my country. Mm. You know, we are not rich. We don't have oil, we don't have gold. The minerals is a latest discovery. <laughs> but our biggest resources is our people and our ocean and the relationship they have. So we cannot, we might not have all the latest cars, the latest gadget, but we have beautiful clean air, we have beautiful beach, we have an ocean that's full of, uh, of living things. Eh? One of the fishermen stood up last week and he was literally screaming at the government for granting this new contract to the company, saying to, you know, it's like you're spitting on my rice. You know, we don't eat rice that much because we have cash crops. But, you know, to an Asian origin, you know, rice, you know, signify your whole upbringing, you know, very basic to you. Yeah. So when somebody is spitting on your rice, that's what he was basically saying. You are trying to actually kill my very livelihood. Yeah. You, it's like you're walking into my house and start knifing me and my kids and my children. Mm -hmm. Because if you remove, you know, if you let deep sea mining go ahead, that is what is going to happen in Tonga. Wow. And it, and the, also because the this whole idea of, you know, they're selling is, don't worry, Tonga. Why are you worried? It's so far away. And to a small island who don't travel that many times and to a community, you know, it's like you're saying to a Tongan, oh, it's freezing out here. It's minus eight. They have no concept of what you're talking about. <laughs> so the closest I could tell my mother and my grandmother is if you open the freezer, and you go inside and close it for a couple of hours, that's probably, oh, really, that cold? Yes, that's cold. <laughs> so when people say these community, community is like, it's so far away, how can you conceptualize far away when you don't know what far away means? Mm. The whole idea of the ocean connecting all of us together, they won't know because they will take a boat from one small island to another small island. And they will know if some of the people have done uh, their some traditional practice in Tonga that you can take a very small tree plant and you wash it over a pool uh, in the reef and it will stun. It will stun the fish and you can, you know, for a couple of hours and you can pick just the, the big ones. And put it in your basket and that's for consumption. And, you know, when the herbs effect wears off, the fish will run off. Mm -hmm. There has been some people who, you know, are very greedy and they get a bigger pool. So people have seen it. So that's our example of implicating what you see mining would mean. It's like introducing that it's not going to be a nump effect. It's going to be a kill effect because we don't know what the bloom will do to all the gills of the fish, the suffocation of all the, because they have seen the bigger ones. You know, we have seen in our agriculture show an example of what those squeak that lives in, you know, four Ks down, two Ks down. Right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, it's just like, you know, the ocean is a key part of your way of life. And to have people come in who don't have any connection to that culture, 
to any connection to that land or those waters to say, oh, well, you know, it's here. We're, it's here to, for us to use. And, you know, you're just a small island nation. You're going to reap some of the benefits from what we're doing. You should just be grateful, right? It's like such a, co such a colonizer mindset in all the ways, for sure. And it's, and, and again, I think, We've just seen history repeat itself. And this is just another example of human ego and prioritizing profit over the planet. And people keep saying, oh, yeah, like, we care about climate change. We care about ESG and environmental sustainability. But ultimately, we got to make money and we don't really care who we push out of the way in the process. And deep sea bed mining is no better than that. So I wanted to, you know, you were recently at the C7 Summit in Japan, and you really stood up and, and talked about how destructive this industry is, and that you said those minerals are habitats for the resources that we live off of every day. I wanted to know, what did it feel like being in that room with decision makers who could actually do something about this issue, but we're choosing not to. Like, what did that feel like? And yeah, what has been your experience of talking to world leaders to get them to reconsider this practice? I think what actually came through to me at the time is that it's so easy for us to actually talk about human dignity and human, you know, human rights based approach to whole things in life. And they're very lacking in the practice, you know. Our mouth says one thing and our action don't match up. Sitting through that whole discussion and seeing people just talking about, they talk about climate crisis, which is true. My country has been named as the second most vulnerable to natural disaster in the whole world. Right next to Vanuatu, both of them are Pacific Islanders. And Vanuatu is not actually supporting deep sea mining. Tonga seems to be supporting deep sea mining. And the government seems to be, you know, willing to go all the way out. And that's the most disappointing thing to me. But I was thinking, always, Christy, that because it's an international beast, you need to find an international sort to chop mm. off their head. <laughs> because drying here, it's not going to happen. Mm. You know, we are a minority in the international platform. And if we don't stand together, with the whole civil society body, we're going to get chopped off again and again and again. So when I was sitting there on that day and listening to the civil society, this is a collection of the top-notch civil society organization who should be representing the whole voices for the likes of us who barely have a space to issue our gaze. So that's the most disturbing and most painful and really hurting things for me. It's like we're basing the whole of human rights base. And, you know, science should be sufficient enough for them to be informed that climate change blast deep sea mining is an absolutely, absolutely no. Mm. It's the very bomb that will be exploding right up in our faces. Yeah. But it wasn't there. So, you know, and I think we really need to be very mindful that if we're going to have human rights based approach to a whole of thing, you know, there are those like us who represent the little guys who might not have the might and the political strength to be aggressively, you know, shoving our way through in a lot of political decision in the world. But we have the right because a combination of a whole lot of us should be represented out there. Right. And yeah, I, I completely agree. I think it speaks to these bigger conversations around the climate crisis period and, and that people who think they're coming up with the solutions don't actually come from any of the communities that are the most vulnerable, right? And this is, again, another case study of that, where it's like, 
people who are pushing for a lot of these geoengineer technologies or these technologies to get us to transition again they're like well this is just the inevitable impact that's going to happen these communities are going to be sacrificed it's like wait what like that doesn't make any sense and so i want to get into alternatives right solutions if we get a moratorium on deep seabed mining what are some of the technologies or the solutions that could be proposed and something that we talk about in the previous episode i did on this we talked about that companies and corporations that have been mining for these minerals in the first place should be held accountable to create more of a closed loop system of their minerals i want to know if you could talk to maybe some of that from what you've seen as like alternative solutions to deep sea mining if we did get a moratorium how can companies source these minerals or be held accountable to not have to mine and extract from places like Tonga? I just want to know a little bit more on your viewpoint on alternatives and solutions. Chris, this is really critical because our fight, we also need the source alternative. Yeah. Because the climate crisis is still going to happen and Tonga will still suffer. So we can't just spill things out there and not consider what are the alternatives because we still need to curb climate warming, the, you know, the frequency, the intensity, which has science has led to a lot of human activities that we actually contribute a lot to this one. So that we, we started a project back in 2012 when I started Deep Sea Mining campaign, we started a project that was actually financed by the global environmental facilities. Mm. We collected all old computers, old fridges, anything that we can actually unpack, taken apart, recycle, and then send back all the golden pieces, all the medical pieces, all the plastic, and we shipped that to Australia. So... We did that in 2012, 13, 14, and 15. Then when we finished the funding for the project, but it worked so well. And these are some of the stuff that we need to do. Recycling existing one, because I believe, and there has been a lot of studies now that are actually coming up with results that are really amazing. If we're driving toward actually getting the still the same minerals that are being advocated to be contained in the one in the ocean, we have already have a stockpile out there. You know, rather than reinventing new things, Mm -hmm. why don't we reinvest in recycling? Mm -hmm. You know, the Pacific is also a dumping place for all this age gadget of Mm -hmm. the global north Mm -hmm. why don't they reinvest back in the south so we can recycle all of this and they could take all the rare minerals from a lot of these um you know equipments and infrastructures that we have in place there is also a very high chance that terrestrial mining is not going to stop they are actually building up to be more of them. As yes. from the experience in the that Japan was the thing I wa- uh, Yeah, j- just really quickly, I just want to jump in that like for people listening to this, a big thing that they're pushing with deep seabed mining is that it's going to like reduce the amount of on land mining. But we sh- the data is showing that actually land mining is continuing to increase tenfold. So it's a bunch of BS. Again, it's just like a marketing PR thing. Just want- continue on. I just want to include that in there. Yes. So as the trip from Japan has reflected, the, like you said, it's going to increase because the backfire impact of these so-called lying uh, marketing is the fact that they targeting the deep sea money, not counting the impact on what is already in place. Mm-hmm. Every other mining companies that related to lithium, you know, cobalt, copper and that are going to just gone up because we all know it'll take a lot longer to start any mining operation. So by the year 
seventh, eighth, and ninth for them to turn profit. Those who are already established on land will be making mega bucks on mm -hmm. top, you know, cannibalizing on the marketing they're already done now, right? So that will be the dog fight between, you know, terrestrial and deep sea mining companies. The implication to us who are going to feel the impact, like Tonga, it's not going to be even good because we know that the climate crisis will increase, the world temperature will increase, the consumption of fuel is going to increase, and that also the lies that are not being told. You know, up from the whole marketing, you know, clutter is behind that operation. There are going to be a lot of fuel use mm -hmm. to undertake mining on land. What about those ships that are going to be floating out there? Are they going to be just all electricity? <laughs> or are they going to still need fuel right. to be operation? To... So, you know, nobody is talking about what are the fuel consumption that calculated or factor into deep sea mining. Mm -hmm. No company has ever come up with that. So it's all the whole glory, glory, glittery, glittery story. Right. So those are the questions that has been coming around. Eh? So a, a lot of now in civil society have gone into the whole idea that we need to recycle, repack, and reposition what we already have. And another thing I say is gun human being, lower their greedy, and their ambition to get more and more and more. You know, rich people should be charged for having over two or three cars because mm -hmm. they contribute very close. The fact that they have money, they line up a whole, you know, it's so fancy when people keep on saying like, oh, so-and-so and so have the latest model that, you know, and in their garage, they have all kind of cars, you know, mm -hmm. stack up the fastest. The gym. And all I could think of is like, oh my goodness, you know, how much, does society have to pay for that right. in the amount of emission they have or amount of like, you know, those are the things that get into my head. Okay? So larger company and richer companies should be paying yeah. social doll for, you know. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where electric vehicles here in the global north, you know, are becoming a really trendy and amazing thing. And I think you know, there, there, is a, there is something to say that electric vehicles, at least here, you know, could make a positive impact in the longer term, right? But then we have to realize that a lot of companies, a lot of electric vehicle companies are not necessarily holding themselves accountable to addressing the mining of those minerals, right? And so it's important that for people who maybe want to buy an electric vehicle here in America or in the global north that you're looking into, does that company support deep sea bed mining for its minerals? Has it made some sort of stance or association that shows that they're addressing that? I think is really important. I've been like definitely talking to different electric vehicle companies to start understanding how they are sourcing things. And I understand that a lot of those practices to do it more sustainably can be costly and can be expensive, but at the same time, like there needs to, then, then you need to figure out technologies to recycle your batteries, figure out technologies to hold your companies accountable to the waste that they're producing. And so I think it's a, a both and conversation where it's like, okay, maybe we do need to manufacture things like solar panels, electric vehicles here in the global north because we are producing the emissions causing the climate crisis. And at the same time, we don't need to be mining the deep sea to do that. So why are you not investing the money into the research and development to find alternatives to that if you have all this money to do that? You know what I mean? Because the, at the end of the day, like maybe it saves money, quote unquote, in, in the short term. But in the long term, I mean, it's going to be irreversible damage. So that's gonna cost everyone a lot more, so for sure. So I just wanted to know, you know, you brought up this call to action, June 29th is kind of this like, decide. it seems like it's a deciding like turning point, maybe moment when it comes to the International Seabed Authority. I just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more like, what is the urgency of this matter? How can, especially 
you know, young people who are listening to this episode, how can they learn more, get involved? What's at stake right now and what's happening? It's very timely. So I want to know a little bit more if you if you could get into calls to action. A lot of young people are going to be listening to this episode. What is the urgency? How can they take action? Let us know more information. Okay, thank you. Christy, the 29 triggers a big milestone to campaigners against Ipsy Money because if ISA proceed with approving the granting of exploitation license to a whole lot of the company applying, it triggers, you know, mega wars to a whole lot of that across the world. You might not know, and I did not refer to it, but 31 license for exploitation have been granted by the ISA. So you can imagine 31 granted for exploitation and 31 companies in our deep ocean, you know, banging away and, you know, vibrating our very earth base, you know, universe, like womb, I must say. It's something that really, really worries a, a whole lot of us in the South. June 8 is the Ocean Day. So we are hosting, you know, dialogue across the Pacific, launching the, you know, the legal review that has been done in Tonga and the assessment of Nori EIA that has been put in, you know, our specific obligation under UN, various conventions. So these things that we need to actually hold government accountable. You know, for some of our governments, like the one in Tonga, we were a couple of steps late because government usually go ahead without consulting us. So even though we're there, and but it's not going to stop what we're doing. On the 20th of, of this month, we're going to hold a regional rally against deep sea mining. We're calling on our civil society to take to the ocean on a boat, whatever means of a boat you have, you know, your little canoe, your little, you know, dingy, get to the ocean on this day with a banner, a folder, a piece of cloth, whatever your statement will be. And we're going to try to film that across the whole region from the, you know, western, the eastern side of the Pacific, the north. And we're going to highlight this internationally. Mm. And we're going to use this as our part of our game bang against. Because we understand there will be a ISA closed door meeting in Tonga. And only two civil society space has been granted. Wow. We have been lobbying and we're asking for, you know, us to have an opportunity to present. We don't know whether it's going to happen because the SG for ISA, the Secretary General, is the one who is approving and granting the invitation. So mm. we're going to rally outside. And I'm thinking, you know, if you can, you know, wherever you are, get to the ocean, or if you can't get to the ocean, you know, have a statement and share it internationally. We're hoping that we can share our campaign as well on this day across as wide a media platform as we can. So people will know that this is our voice. This is what we are saying. Great. Because we're saying not, we don't want banded sea mining. We don't want it in our island in our region, nor in our world. Mm -hmm. So that is a message that has been unanimously supported in Tonga, but I know there are other regions going, you know, moratorium or ban, but this is our state. So yeah. we, I'm traveling through the outer islands now. So I'll be back in the main island on the 17th. And hopefully on the 20th, we're going to rally across the whole region and that's the messaging we want we just you know wherever you can you know you have a right to actually be out there bold and say this is your world too so i'm saying this is your world as a youth this is your world 
you have the damn right to say to whoever is up there, you know, they are temporary. Interim, you might be there. But your tomorrows, you deserve to say it now. You know, you are a leader now. You don't have to be a so-called adult before you make decision. You have a right to dictate to the world who is currently managing. Because that's what people should know. We are just managers. We're managing resources that has been granted to us. That's not for you to exploit or destroy it because you owe it to the next one to pass it on. So the in the generation right, you know, it was granted to you. And whatever form it was granted to you, you can make it better before you pass it on to the next one. Amazing. And so to wrap up, so just remind us, like, what are some key days of action that people mm. can take action? Is there a petition? Is there a place people can donate? If you can share just more ways, like if there's any website or some way people who, can, who are listening, they can, like, take action with you all this month. Okay. Thank you very much. We have a whole group of association that we're actually working with. So... In Tonga, we don't have a helpline or help website where we can donate. I, we have been running this campaign since 2012, and we didn't receive our first support until 2020. So wow. the first one we received was a $4,000 support from TSCC, for Sea Mining Coalition, Conservation Coalition. So they did just to support our media, to get out there. But the fight is there. It, the money would be most welcome. But when there is none, we'll still have the struggle and more. I know there are other organizations such as yours. So to wrap up this episode, you know, you provided us with such incredible information, but I want to tell the listeners back home, you know, I have a lot of people here in America and the global north who will be listening to this episode. What are some ways that they can learn about upcoming actions to help amplify from abroad and is there any way that they can follow you on social media donate to your cause okay thank you very much i think we from now on our program for june is really fun on from now until the 17th we're collating information from all across the island on the 8th which is next week there will be a broadcast across the uh, the region that will be a streamlined event that will be going on. So civil society have their Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We have a website. So, you know, it's dot, 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 C-S-F-T dot T-O. That's actually our address. Or you can find us on Facebook, Civil Society Forum of Tonga. So... I will share the information with you, Kirsty, so you can post it if you need, and you can follow us on that one. On the 17th, we'll have the first draft statement, and that could be shared also through our media. On the 20th, we are going to rally outside. That's when the ISA closed-door meeting will happen in our capital. We'll be rallying outside the, um, the hotel. I might be outside if I'm not accepted to be inside and I might be inside presenting our statement if I'm allowed to enter on the 20th as well we have asked to be for a civil society de demonstration of our wish to ban or go moratorium all across the Pacific and that's mean we're going to ask our community who have both dingy of whatever it is they use for their fishing to be out there in touch with the ocean floating on it and demonstrating to the world that we wanted to protect our ocean that we wanted deep sea mining to be banned stop or precautionary pause whatever it is we are going to have that demonstration on the 20th amazing and it hmm. and if anyone wanted to help that is also another information that we can give out for anyone who wanted to financially support or help the work that we're actually doing on the ground. I will also pass on that information to her, Steve. Great, great. Awesome. And people can read in the show notes. I'll be including ways that people can donate. 
and support as well as those social handles to learn more information. And is there any last statement you wanted to leave the audience with that they should think about when it comes to deep sea bed mining? Any last words that you have? Thank you. Deep sea mining is not the answer to climate crisis. Deep sea mining means death to Pacific South. It's my right to ask you also to defend that right. Stop deep sea mining. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tita, for joining our episode of Brown Girl Green to teach people about the dangers of deep sea mining, especially to the island of Tonga, as well as the actions people can take. As was mentioned, definitely make sure that you follow their organization, the Civil Society of Tonga, as well as just to learn about how more communities in the global south are fighting against deep sea mining. And as, as Tita mentioned, there's going to be a rally around June 20th, the end of the month, because the ISA is going to be making a lot of decisions towards the end of the month around licensing and allowing more companies to be allowed to do deep sea mining. And we really wanna make sure there's amplification to say that, you know, especially young people were watching these companies and this is our future, this is the planet and we can't allow deep sea mining to be a part of that. So thank you so much, Tita, for your time, for joining us on today's episode. And yeah, let's all work together to ban deep sea mining. Thanks everyone. <laughs>